Welcome to AEI. I'm delighted you've all joined us here today in person and online. My name is Catherine Stevens. I'm a resident scholar here at AEI and very pleased to be introducing today's event on the recently released report, A Roadmap to Reducing Child Poverty. I'd like to begin with quick background on today's event. The report we're discussing today is the outcome of a bill passed by Congress in 2015 mandating the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine conduct a comprehensive study of child poverty in the US and provide a list of evidence-based policies that could reduce child poverty by 50% within 10 years. A bipartisan committee of 15 expert academic scholars was appointed and worked for two years to produce a 600-page report based on that charge. Much of the discussion around a report like this tends to focus on the accuracy of the report's findings. Things like whether it calculates the rate of child poverty correctly, how strong the evidence is for specific policies listed, and so forth. But today, the purpose of our event is to explore a dynamic that we don't pay enough attention to here in DC, whether on the left or the, the right. Very thoughtful researchers come up with ideas that make great sense on paper. But there's another question. What's actually necessary in the real world to transform those ideas into on-the-ground reality that actually improves children's lives? In particular, a report like this faces two big initial hurdles in going from on paper to changing people's lives. The first is turning report proposals into congressional authorization for new federal spending. We think we know what that entails, but I've come to believe that we actually oversimplify that aspect of the federal policy universe, and I think many of us outside of Congress understand it less well than we may realize. The second problem is this. Assuming that additional federal spending is authorized, how much will that new spending really help poor children out in the country's 50 states where they live? We gloss over this problem in DC, but it's of enormous importance. When it comes to domestic policy, essentially all the federal government can do is send money. The actual impact of that money depends entirely on how it's deployed on the ground, and that largely depends on state governments. So I'm thrilled that we have a panel of experts here today who are perfect for addressing these issues. First, we have two members of the report committee, Ron Haskins and Robert Moffitt, who both participated in shaping and writing the report. Ron is a developmental psychologist currently a scholar at the Brookings Institution and a senior consultant at the Annie A. Casey Foundation. Ron also has substantial experience in the federal government, working as a senior advisor for welfare policy to George W. Bush, and prior to that, as a senior staffer for the House Committee on Ways and Means. Robert Moffat is a professor of economics at Johns Hopkins University, holding a joint appointment with the Bloomberg School of Public Health. His research focuses on the economics of poverty and welfare programs for the poor and the economics of the labor market. In addition to the two researcher members of our panel, we have two longtime former practitioners who bring two very different but essential perspectives on what we could think of as the implementation of a report like this first at the federal and second at the state level. Matt Weidinger is now a colleague at AEI as a resident fellow in poverty studies. His work focuses on federal safety net policies, including cash welfare, child welfare, disability benefits, and unemployment insurance. Before joining AEI, though, Matt worked for many years in Congress. Until this past fall, he was Deputy Staff Director of the House Committee 
on Ways and Means and served as the longtime staff director of that committee's subcommittee on human resources, which has jurisdiction over federal spending on safety net programs. Jim Demas, our other practitioner, recently retired as secretary of the Illinois Department of Human Services. In that position, he had executive authority over the state's anti-poverty, behavioral health, and physical and developmental disability programs and services. He led a statewide network comprising five divisions, 145 local offices, seven state psychiatric hospitals, seven state-operated developmental centers, and thousands of provider agencies. He oversaw an annual budget of over $6 billion and a workforce of 13,000 employees who carry out those programs and services in Illinois. So our agenda today is as follows. Robert is going to give about a 25-minute presentation on key parts of the report to make sure we're all on the same page with what it says, followed by a panel discussion with thoughts and reactions from our diverse group of researchers and implementers. Then we'll conclude with 10 or 15 minutes um, of Q&A from the audience. And for those of you joining us online, if you have questions, please tweet them to hashtag RoadmapAEI, hashtag RoadmapAEI, which is our hashtag for this event. Finally, I want to emphasize that our goal today is not consensus, but rather to have a good conversation that might expand at least a bit our collective understanding about important parts of reality that bear on the federal government's role and potential in addressing critical social and economic problems like child poverty. So with that, please join me in welcoming Robert Moffat. Hey, thank you, Catherine. And uh, welcome. So the uh, come up soon. There we go. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, happy, thank you, Catherine, for inviting me and engineering this event, and uh, very happy to come and talk about this report uh, from the committee at the National Academies that Ron and I were members of, and Ron and I both enjoyed the work. It took a couple of years, and uh, we uh, think we have quite a few things to say, but I'm, and I'm just going to run, run through. If I can do it in 25 minutes, I'll certainly make every attempt, and just to hit the highlights, uh, and but I look forward to the discussion because we touch upon some of the things that Catherine mentioned, uh, but not all by any means, implementation on the ground, uh, uh, political receptivity in Congress, uh, state level involvement, whether it really affect children. Uh, some of those things are in there, some of them in there more than less, so the discussion will certainly be good if we can focus on that. Okay, so um, background, Catherine already mentioned this uh, study was commissioned by Congress <clears throat> by a bill in 2015, Comprehensive Study of Child Poverty in the United States. Uh, we had three elements of what we call the statement of uh, uh, task at the academies, but other people would call it the charge of the committee. There were three things we were uh, asked to do, and if you know anything about National Academy committees, they try to be very specific, because they don't want you wandering all over the place and studying everything you want to study. Study this, this, and this, and they try to be very precise. So the first thing was review the word, uh, all the work that we can find, research, on linkages between child poverty and child outcomes. This is all about children. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so to question, for example, does uh, family income by itself uh, have any effect, pro or con, on children? Uh, how about specific uh, uh, transfer programs out there? Is there any research that's looked at their impacts on children? Look at it and tell us, Congress, uh, what you find. So that's one. A second one was to uh, provide an objective analysis of the poverty reducing effects of existing programs. And we have a whole chapter on whether current programs reduce poverty or not. And I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to skip it. It's all in the report. 
Uh, it's not directly germane to what I think we really want to talk about today, which is the programs. What should we do going forward, not where, what we have today? So uh, read it if you like. And then this third one is the most important. Provide a list of alternative evidence-based policies that could reduce child poverty and deep poverty by 50% uh, within, um, within 10 years. And I'm going to talk about that because every word in that charge is relevant. Uh, so what does it say? Alternative policies. One thing I want to emphasize is that we were not asked to recommend anything to Congress, and we did not recommend anything to Congress. We were asked to come up with a list of alternative policies and to simply find if, uh, if there were any according to the evidence we, as we read it, that would reduce power, child poverty by 50% within 10 years. Whether Congress wants to do that, or the President wants to do that, is up to them. We're not recommending anything. We're just doing some calculations. Okay, that's very important. Evidence-based, this is gonna come up repeatedly here, and uh, we put a very, very high bar on evidence. Uh, and uh, we talked about this a lot in the committee, and we've talked about it a lot with other uh, people who've read our report. Uh, uh, we're all researchers. <laughs> not all of them are academics. Ron's not academic. We have uh, two or three people who are not academics. Nevertheless, the evidence bar is very high. Now, if you do program evaluation, if you're a researcher, you know that the gold standard for any evaluation is an RCT, an experiment. You randomize people into one uh, uh, experimental group, and you randomize people to the control group, you give the, uh, uh, the new program or whatever you're trying to test the effects of to the treatment group, and you did not have the control group, you compare the outcomes. That's the gold standard, and whenever we could find evidence from an RCT, that's what we went with. If we, however, it's very difficult to do those kind of experiments, and then lots of times it's not feasible. If we couldn't find any uh, experiments, RCTs, we looked for what we call some very strong natural experiments, where something happened and there was a very good uh, comparison group where there was a group of people who, for some reason, did not get the uh, pr new program or the reform, but seemed to be very similar to those who did, and then you compare their outcomes. We ruled out tons of stuff that did not meet those criteria, and that's going to come up repeatedly. So evidence base is really important here, and that we put a bar. 50% is a very, very ambitious uh, goal to reduce child poverty. Congress said, we want, that's what we want you to look at. It's an ambitious uh, goal. And do it within 10 years. <laughs> so not only is that a lot, but do it fast. 10 years basically is tomorrow, OK? Uh, the, the, you, you, there's many things you can simply not do that fast. So uh, that greatly limited the kinds of things we could do. And I've listed here uh, something we just have to, we keep emphasizing to uh, so many people here. If you have a short time frame here, that rules out all kinds of uh, child investment policies that have a long-run impact. Uh, early child education, K to 12, well, maybe high school you know, might get an impact uh, if you do something with adolescence within 10 years, but maybe or maybe not. Uh, depends on how quickly it can occur. Um, all kinds of policies, uh, that human capital policies, long-run investments in training uh, are not going to happen that fast. So we simply did not look at them. They were ruled out of our purview, and uh, uh, not because they're not important, because we were asked not to look at them impl implicitly. Uh, maybe we can talk about that, because uh, you should say, gee, we need another report here. <laughs> we need another report to look at those things and not these uh, very short-run outcomes. So anyway, um, uh, that those are very, very important uh, aspects of our charge, uh, which shaped what we did and what we uh, therefore found. Okay, so um, I want to emphasize, too, that our charge in writing said to measure poverty. We had to use these, what's called the supplemental poverty line. Uh, we did that, of course, because that's what we were required to do. We do have a discussion in the report of the official poverty line, it's called, which the Census Bureau uses, alternative poverty measures, uh, and so on. I'm not going to talk about that today uh, at all whatsoever, uh, and if we want to want me to say something about it later, I'll say why I, I think it's not that relevant to what we were asked to do. You can draw the poverty line many different ways, and I think our, our calculations of programs uh, would still be relevant. But anyways, just want to tell you, I, I'm not going to talk about poverty measurement at all. Uh, there's the committee, as Catherine said, uh, 15 people. It was very diverse in terms of disciplinary background, 
also the diverse uh, from the uh, political perspective people came from, uh, really uh, the gamut. So uh, there was that. Um, we had to produce what's called a consensus report, and that meant that everybody on the whole, that list there, <laughs> everybody had to agree. They couldn't, actually, national category reports can't have dissents. Uh, we had no dissenters. Everyone signed off on the report, everyone on that list. Um, okay, so we had some sponsors in uh, who helped us out with a lot of money in addition to the money that the Congress provided to DHHS, and that's a list. Uh, I, I want to thank all supporters of the study who helped us out. Uh, the final report is on the web, issued last February. It's all there. It's 600 pages, but I want to say uh, that 400 of those are appendices. <laughs> and we actually, we made a really serious attempt to write it in a way that you could actually get something out of it by only spending an hour or two hours. We, these chapters are pretty short, and it, we tried to write them in kind of a pithy way that you could just get the nugget pretty quickly. If you want to know the details, all the appendices there, if you're the wonk, yeah, go for it. It's all there uh, if you really want to get into it. So, um, but uh, it's actually intended to be accessible. Had a really outstanding study director. Okay, I'm going to start off just telling you what our bottom line findings were before getting into all the nitty-gritty details. Just get it all out there. On that first charge, uh, is, what, what does the research evidence show about the effect of child poverty and poverty programs on children? And again, we put a very high bar. We basically did not really consider any correlational study. It had to be an RCT or it had to be a very strong natural experiment, which ruled out many, many things. Uh, and we found in the things we looked at that there's strong evidence that, uh, uh, that child poverty does hurt children and both has negative outcomes after they become adults, they grow up in poverty. Uh, and we also found some very strong studies of specific programs, SNAP, our food stamp program, Medicaid and EITC, uh, studies, number of studies, which I will mention briefly in, in a minute, uh, which showed uh, evidence that those programs actually helped various child outcomes, improved many child outcomes. Um, uh, and what about that third charge? I'm skipping the second one. The third one, could, could we find any programs for which the evidence indicated uh, that child poverty could be uh, reduced by 50% very quickly? And we found two kind of combinations of programs, not a single program. And I'll tell you exactly in a minute what, what they were. But just to get the finding out there, yes, the answer is yes, we found two. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, I'm going to describe them. I'm calling them combination one and combination two. Both of them increased employment among low-income populations, one by 404,000 jobs, one by uh, uh, 611,000 jobs. One of them cost $90 billion, and one of them cost $108 billion. Okay, so we, and, and putting a price tag on it was part of our job here. And so we found them and said, okay, if you want to do it, here's how much it's going to cost. Uh, but I want to emphasize that we were, and I'll get into this uh, explicitly in a minute, we were also looking for programs that would increase employment, not decrease employment. Uh, so we found pro looking for programs that would reduce poverty, and, and increase employment of the poor, both of those. And we found two combinations of programs that achieved both of those goals. Um, now, those are, cost a lot of money. And so even though we, weren't, we, we could have said, we're going home now, <laughs> and uh, we achieved our charge, we said, no. What if you don't want to spend that amount of money? Well, let's look at some other programs that don't cost so much. And so we found some other programs, which I'm going to talk about, which don't cost nearly that amount. They're not going to reduce poverty by 50%. But you can get some pretty good reductions uh, with a lot less money. And we systematically costed out the employment co uh, dollar amount and poverty reducing impacts of a wide variety of programs. And the way we as a committee thought we were, what we were doing with this report was, yeah, we're achieving the goal here of you, Congress, yeah, 50%. We're offering a menu here. There are a whole bunch of uh, programs out there, ranging from very expensive to much less expensive. And each one of them has a different cost, different employment impact, different child poverty impact. We have a menu. This report offers a menu for policymakers to choose from. OK, so uh, I want to talk about details of all these. Let's take the first one. I don't, and be happy to talk about each of these studies. This is the charge number one. What's the evidence that uh, programs uh, uh, affect children? And um, so there are a whole bunch of them here, and all of them have strengths and weaknesses. But we did put a very high bar. Every one of these is either uh, an experiment 
or a very strong natural experiment. Uh, okay, uh, so one of them is a negative income tax. I'm not going to take the time to go into description of each one of these. So so-called negative income tax experiments, a lot, very old, 1970s, uh, found that uh, providing substantial uh, uh, cash uh, funds to low-income families resulted in achievement gains for school children uh, measured by test scores. Uh, the earned income tax credit, there's been a lot of work on that. I'll mention only two things, one of them showing that uh, the earned income tax credit increases math and reading scores of children. Um, and another one uh, that showed, uh, these are different studies that showed that it increased uh, high school graduation rates. Uh, uh, there's also another study, a third one of the earned income tax credit, showing that uh, receipt of EITC funds uh, in, uh, during the prenatal period when the woman's pregnant increased, uh, uh, sorry, decreased infant mortality and increased uh, birth weight. Uh, the um, uh, child uh, studies uh, of the Canadian child benefit, uh, and those were shown to improve child test scores and also child maternal health. Uh, there's been quite a few studies of the food stamp program, SNAP. Uh, one of them showed that uh, SNAP increases, uh, um, uh, increases child school attendance and child health. Uh, number of studies of Medicaid uh, showing that that reduces infant mortality and in, uh, decreases the hospital visits and increases child health more generally. Okay, that was it for, for the impact of, uh, of our review of research. And I said, happy to talk about that more, but I really want to talk about the programs we propose. So we went after programs, and the, the committee described, the report describes what we did, which is we, we sat around, what are people talking about today is about new programs. And then we went out and we asked uh, like 50 people to just write memos. What's your idea? And then we had these little sessions where we had people come in uh, and talk to us so, uh, about what their favorite ideas. So we got a lot of information. And for every program, we applied five criteria. The most important was, what's the strength of the evidence that would reduce poverty? And once again, we put a very, very high bar that evidence had to show, either through an RCT or a very strong natural experiment, that poverty would be reduced by that program. And we ruled out a lot of programs which did not have evidence that met our bar. Uh, it had to be a sizable. The prediction, the studies we looked at, we didn't want to look at studies which just had, you know, a tiny of impact. So obviously the magnitude would matter. We did pick out some high-risk subgroups, and we decided, well, we should look to see if it actually uh, uh, imp impacts uh, uh, people at high risk, and I can talk about that later. Relative cost. We didn't want to constrain ourselves from the get-go on cost, because that wasn't our charge. We were asked to find some programs that achieve that goal and, and say and calculate what the cost was. Put it out there. We did that. At the same time, you know, we actually did rule things out. We were more expensive than those combinations, believe it or not, like the universal basic income, UBI, no. We actually simulated it, no. Uh, so uh, we did actually rule some things out. And finally, uh, we did, for every program we looked at, say what's the impact of this program on work, marriage, opportunity, and social inclusion. And that work was the most important in the list, although the others are also important. And that's why the programs we came up with that achieved the goal actually increased in uh, work, not decreased it. So in, came, in the end, we picked, we picked 10 programs with it more or less satisfied all these criteria, more or less. We didn't insist on every one of them uh, satisfying uh, all five to the same degree. And here's a long list of them, uh, of the, of the uh, 10 we came up with. Uh, expanding the earned income tax credit. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that that reduces poverty. Child care subsidies, expand those. Uh, uh, raise the federal, federal minimum wage. These in this upper left-hand box there are all policies that are intended, at least, to increase work. On the federal minimum wage, I want to immediately say that we calculated disemployment effects of the minimum wage. We used a CBO report. We didn't calculate it ourselves. We just took a CBO report from about three or four years ago. CBO just issued another one like last week, and I haven't looked to see if their estimates are different than the one before yet. Uh, but we calculated disemployment impacts of the federal minimum wage. We didn't increase it to 15. We said increase it to $1025 an hour, uh, okay, 1025 only. And furthermore, we also said if a state is a really low wage state, and that minimum wage put them above the 10th percentile of that wage distribution, we're not going to go up there. Keep it down at the 10th percentile. We didn't want any, even 1025 in a low wage state, to be too high up in that wage distribution. So we capped it at the 10th percentile of a state wage distribution. Um, 
okay, uh, we found, we looked at training programs. Most of them have longer end impacts. And in fact, if you know anything about the job training literature, it's a kind of a dismal <laughs> literature, actually. It's very, very hard to get good, big impacts out of most training programs out there. We found one that's gotten a lot of publicity that MDRC evaluated called Work Advanced, which had really huge impacts, far greater than most other uh, job training programs. It hasn't really been to tested over and over again, but we went for it and, and, and picked that one out. On the lower left is an immigrant uh, uh, policy. Uh, again, you know, we tried to let politics stay out of this. Some people have suggested this. We said, okay, well, let's find out how much impact, uh, say, for example, um, uh, allowing legal immigrants, but those who are currently unqualified for receipt of benefits, to receive benefits, only legal immigrants. Let's see if it has any impact on poverty. I should say we picked all these programs before calculating the impacts. We just picked them on a priori grounds. And after that, we did the simulations to find out, OK, which ones have an impact. And it turns out a lot of them are very tiny. So OK, that's not going to do it. But uh, OK, and then we have more traditional safety net programs, housing subsidies, child care subsidies, and SSI. And then in the lower right, two programs which haven't really been used in the United States. Uh, expand, uh, replacing the child tax credit with a, 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 a nearly universal child allowance. I say near universal because we did cut it off. We didn't give it to everybody in the whole income distribution. We capped it at about 300% of the poverty line. Um, and then uh, also child support assurance. Uh, a lot of men don't pay child support. We know that. Uh, have the government step in and, and pick up the tab if the, if the father doesn't do it. So those are the programs. Uh, we simulated two versions of each, kind of a more generous and less generous, just to see how the, the magnitude uh, would be affected. Uh, okay, so I want to jump right to, the, to the, that key finding. We did find two combinations of programs uh, that did meet this 50% goal, and they are... Um, uh, Ah, okay, there we go. Uh, they are shown uh, uh, in the last two columns. I so said we found two. Um, I'm having a little bit of a hard time here. I can't quite see that. Uh, the, um, uh, so the one in the, th uh, the last column uh, has the uh, EITC expansion, child care expansion, uh, minimum wage increase, uh, and then it also has a, that child allowance and child support assurance and also the immigration restrictions. Uh, some of these are more important than others, like the immigration is going to turn out, I'll show you, really didn't do anything. So uh, the, the key ones here are really the others. Uh, that, if you uh, look down here, that got achieved the goal we were asked to find, which is a minus 50.7 and a minus 53.3. It did cut child poverty in half. Uh, the uh, increases in the number of jobs, workers, is shown down there, which I said before, uh, 404,000 and 611,000, and then the costs are the same. Okay, so we did that, but then we said, what's, can we find things that are cheaper, and how much would they call, uh, reduce poverty? Um, so here's one uh, that has uh, the uh, uh, EITC and the child care subsidy, uh, and, but also the child allowance. That cut poverty by a 30, uh, 30%, 35%. Um, it did also increase jobs, 500, uh, 568,000 additional jobs. Cost 44.5 billion, which are about half, or more, or less than half than of the others. Still a lot of money. Well, what about this one? Okay, let's go back further and have one that's only about work. And so that would be the EITC, child care subsidies, minimum wage, and that work advance uh, job training program. Uh, that one you get 18% uh, reduction, about a fifth uh, reduction uh, in child poverty, uh, and uh, we get almost a million extra workers from that. And the uh, cost is only $8 billion. So uh, you can see the trend here. Uh, I want to emphasize that for all of our calculations of those numbers, we went to the literature and looked at work incentives, the literature on showing whether these programs increase or decrease work, employment. And we know that some programs from that literature uh, have work disincentives and work falls if you implement those programs. And we calculated that. Uh, but a lot of programs like the EITC and child care subsidies have work incentives. So we looked at the literature and pulled numbers from all of those, and they were put in there. What that means is that uh, those numbers are net of the changes in employment, and that's illustrated on this graph, because this graph shows for all four of those uh, combinations I put up there how much the poverty reduction would have been 
if no one had changed their work uh, as a result of the change of policy. And the interesting thing was, because we had all these very strong work incentive programs in there, the EITC and the child care subsidy, which both have major positive impacts on work, on net, every one of our packages increased uh, the child poverty reduction. In other words, if we hadn't, if we'd held employment fixed, the poverty reduction would have been even less than what we calculated. So uh, the uh, people working more make more money, that reduces poverty. So uh, there's that. Uh, what about now each of the programs individually? Suppose you don't want combinations of programs, and none of them came close to our goal, so uh, uh, our charge to 50%, but they all had some impact. Here's the graph showing all 10 and the high and low variation of each. Um, the one that had the biggest impact is down there on the child allowance. Uh, uh, one of them had $3,000 a month per child, which is a pretty generous program, not surprising. But you go up there and the EITC, uh, our more generous EITC, reduced the poverty rate by 2.1%, uh, which I don't think is anything to be sneezed at. <laughs> uh, uh, if we could get a 2.1% uh, reduction in the poverty rate, a lot of people would be very happy with that. Uh, and uh, the others had uh, uh, different impacts. The SNAP and the housing vouchers both had major impacts too. But some of the others, the minimum wage really didn't do much any, of anything. Uh, and I'll talk about why that is if people want to later. Uh, child support, uh, immigrant policies, um, and the work advance, job training, a lot of them didn't, didn't do anything, really. They were very tiny. And really, uh, we said, well, OK. That's what the uh, numbers show after we did the calculations. So uh, we do have a graph here just showing the obvious, which is the more money you spend in general, not in general, but you know, in these specific programs, the more poverty reduction you get. So if you're just only concerned with poverty reduction versus cost, uh, we can go to Congress and say, you pick what you want. <laughs> you, you pick the dot there you want. And uh, if you want a cheap one with less poverty reduction, go for it. But if you want to spend a lot of money and get more, that's up to you. you but there, there's the trade-off. Uh, we also found that there was a trade-off between employment uh, uh, gains and um, uh, the uh, child poverty reduction. And uh, not surprisingly, if you have a lot of programs there are programs below that, that, that the horizontal line which actually reduce employment, uh, okay, because the programs that were there are really only have work disincentive effects, but the ones up above the line, the EIT, for example, have big positive impacts. And when we combined the programs, what we did was we combined programs which had stronger work incentives than work disincentives, and that's why we had net positive gains in employment from the particular combinations of programs that we laid out. Okay, so uh, uh, there's that. So the bottom line here is uh, the, we provided a menu here, a wide variety of alternative programs and combination of programs with different combinations of cost, employment gain, and child poverty reduction. It's a menu for people to choose from, and uh, uh, hopefully the calculations we did are informative and interesting to people who want to try to pick a point, uh, one of those programs or some variation on them. Okay, I'm going to quickly... Uh, just do uh, one uh, uh, last section here, which is I said we ruled out a lot of programs that have been talked about because we didn't think the evidence was strong enough to put them on our list and start simulating them. I'm going to list four of them here. They're all in Chapter 7 of our report if you want to re read it. Uh, and we spent a whole chapter on every one of these. Um, okay, one of them is marriage and fertility uh, programs. And I want to say that we have a section in there stressing how important marriage is uh, in poverty reduction. We agree with that, and all the evidence supports that, strongly supports that. The question is, have we found any policies which really move that needle very much? And the answer is no. Uh, and we reviewed the evidence, and I've listed some of it up there. We haven't found any strong evidence of any programs that consistently have a big impact. And I want to immediately say we did find evidence of a few individual ones in certain areas and countries that have been tested. And our view is, the committee's view is, hey, those look promising. Let's go out and try to expand those. Try those in some other cities. Let's look at that. Uh, so there's not every, every, every policy in every uh, uh, locality. So there's work to be done there. But we certainly didn't have the evidence uh, to start implementing any kind of marriage policy and have any uh, uh, confidence uh, on what kind of poverty impacts it would have. Mandatory work programs. Again, we put the bar very, very high here. Uh, the only RCTs that we're aware of 
uh, for mandatory work programs were from the 1990s, what I call, we like to call the golden era of RCTs when ACF uh, uh, sponsored and heavily subsidized dozens of uh, uh, RCTs on different varieties of mandatory work programs and voluntary ones too, a whole variety of programs in many states around the country that have all been compiled and studied and we, we read that very uh, evidence very uh, carefully and our reading was that the evidence from that, uh, those RCTs is not encouraging on child poverty reduction. The issue is that most of those programs uh, uh, resulted in a lot of re recipients leaving the welfare rolls. And the question was, did they earn enough to outweigh the loss in benefits? And for the single mothers, these were all AFDC mothers that uh, who we were looking at, uh, that uh, uh, depending on the program, uh, there might be some small excess of earnings gain over the benefits lost. For many others, it was just the opposite more benefit loss and earnings gain, which resulted in increases in poverty. Uh, uh, but none of them were very large either, with the positive or the negative. And so, uh, so we said the evidence doesn't seem to be there. And for two-parent families, it was all negative. Uh, all poverty went up for almost every uh, two-parent RCT that had, that had been explored back then. So we said, OK. Now, you know, but we also had a long discussion of this. You know, AFDC uh, mothers and two parents in the 1990s, I mean, how relevant is that? Not very relevant to SNAP, Medicaid, or anything else. So our view is that um, the uh, uh, there's evidence is not there. We don't know whether today a different kind of program on a different population would have an impact on child poverty, we, what the sign or magnitude would be. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, let me see here, I don't, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one of our recommendations was, uh, why haven't we had any RCTs since the 1990s? Uh, in the 1990s, ACF was out there, you know, subsidizing dozens of these things. Where is the ACF? I mean, where are these? Where, where are the RCTs today? They're, they're like, ACF is like, you know, a wall. So uh, uh, we had a very strong recommendation at the end for new uh, federal funding of RCTs to test mandatory work programs. Block grants, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I, I, I don't want to spend too much on this. But, um, I mean, block grants are very, very important. But making a research connection between you change the level, of the level or the rules of a block grant, what would that do to child poverty is a very complex question. Block grants are complex. They have different rules, different funding mechanisms, and lots of people love the ones we have now. Other people hate them. But if you want to, if we had to think about, gosh, we want to go to TANF and increase that block grant by 10%, what impact would that have on child poverty? No one had an idea. I mean, what would they spend the money on? And what programs? Who would they serve? What kinds of benefits? It just couldn't be calculated. Uh, we have a lot of other uh, discussion of block grants in that section of the report. It's kind of in general discussions of the complexity of them, the issue of monitoring what they're intended to do, whether states will do what you want them to do, how tightly to write them. Um, but certainly on an evidence point of view, they weren't there. And then we spent a little bit of time on TANF and uh, uh, whether or not we could re uh, recommend anything for TANF. And we reviewed the evidence there. I have a couple of references there from the report. Of, uh, we reviewed a huge amount of studies that were done uh, back in the, uh, after 1996. And um, our reading of that evidence, and we could be happy to be corrected if you want to go read those reviews and draw your own, because you, know, you have a whole lot of studies and they may or may not agree, and you have to draw some kind of consensus lesson from it. It's not easy because the results are really very different across cities and studies and types of programs. Uh, but we thought the consensus of what the TANF did did in fact reduce poverty rates in the short run, uh, short, a few years after 1996. And so that's a good thing. Uh, we thought that the evidence there uh, for longer run impacts on poverty rates was not there. And uh, partly there weren't a lot of studies because unfortunately everybody stopped funding studies about two, the year 2000 <laughs> and we don't have much uh, studies of TANF after that. But, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, we also have this graph in the report uh, which kind of is consistent with that conclusion. Uh, what that report shows is, is the poverty rate based upon just earnings in the, in the U.S. population and the poverty rate after transfers. And that upper red line shows that um, uh, uh, right after 1996, when that red line was very high, uh, so that's the, uh, uh, the poverty rate based upon your own earnings, it dropped like a rock after 1996. So yes, it really dropped. 
and uh, you can see the black line, the net poverty rate dropped at the same time. That's the, 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 the studies that have looked at this, of course, try to separate out the economy from the EITC, from welfare reform, but they all uh, conclude that TANF had some contribution to that. However, after 2000, uh, the, uh, the uh, poverty rate, just based on the earnings, has gone up and down with no trend. And uh, as of 2020, it's about the same as it was in 2000. But we've had big gains in poverty. Everybody's looked at the poverty rate. It's been going down. And the reason it's been going down is because of transfers. That's the only reason that the poverty rate is down to where it is today. Uh, uh, the SPM poverty rate is 15.6%. But forget the, the number. The, the point is the direction here. And most of that gap is the EITC. That's what it's caused. Most of that poverty reduction, if you list all the programs. So uh, anyway, what's the bottom line here? We didn't think we had any evidence to go back and say, Let's do TANF, more TANF, or apply it to food stamps. I mean, how would we calculate the impact of that? Uh, you know, TANF is a very complex object. Which parts of TANF would you keep the same? Uh, which different? It would be a very challenging task, so we didn't attempt it. So anyway, uh, let me stop there, and I look forward to the comments and discussion. I think you're supposed to be right there. Bob's here. Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't. Oh, okay. I'll take it back. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Practitioner, what can I say? <laughs> Whoops. Sorry about that. So, um, Robert, thank you very much. Uh, that was hugely helpful. That's you. In, in giving us an, an overview of, of what you guys were trying to do and, and what, you, what you found. Um, what I wanted to do was ask uh, each of the other three panelists to just share their maybe five minutes of thoughts and reactions to, um, to, 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 Robert, to Robert's presentation. Um, Matt, do you want to start? Sure. All right. Um, well, first, thank you to Robert and Ron and the rest of the authors of the report. Uh, for anybody that's tried to put together a report even approaching this size and scale, you recognize what a heroic a uh, activity it is, like the Green Book, Ron. So uh, don't drop it on your foot. It you might hurt yourself. Um, it, it, so I'll start out with a couple of positives that are especially strong features of the report that I see. First, kind of to Robert's um, most recent slide about um, how the child poverty rate declined using the SPM. That's, a, I think, a very useful thing to sort of note and to spotlight. And I think it's especially useful for the, for the authors because the SPM is the type of poverty measure that actually counts the types of things that the report suggests we do more of, right? So there, you, know, you can refer to the appendix about the whole discussion about measurement of poverty and all that. But if you want to do things that you think are going to reduce poverty, you better make sure your poverty measure actually counts those things or else you'll not take that into account. And that's one of the flaws of the official poverty measure. But Matt, that just to clarify, the supplemental poverty measure is what that's you're right. referring to, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, second thing is, uh, as Robert also noted, the stress on marriage as a poverty uh, reduction fact. Um, so the report said, decline in two-parent family structure is the single biggest factor associated with the increase in child poverty between the mid-1970s and the early 1990s. However, child poverty has fallen since the early 1990s. Despite continuing increases in single parenthood, this most recent decline in child poverty is most strongly associated with increases in maternal employment, as, as uh, Robert also discussed. So the basic fact of marriage as a bulwark against child poverty is an important thing to stress, even if we really don't have great answers for how we can promote more of that. But um, we should at least discuss that and, and uh, point people in that direction. Um, and the final thing that I think is really strong from the report, as Robert noted throughout, is the idea that work is essential to reducing child poverty. Um, you know, um, we are not going to benefit our way out of child poverty. We can go so far by expanding benefits, but parents need to be working and supporting their families. And so developing programs and benefits that support work and promote more work are essential to that task. Um, 
I will say I was disappointed by the reports not um, recognizing the benefits of work requirements in programs like the TANF program being more essential to reductions in child poverty. I recognize the sort of process reasons for all that. Um, I think given the topic today, I'm not going to really focus on, anybody, on that so much as just point people to, if you want to see some more of my arguments on that point, did a blog right after the um, report came out. Um, and obviously, there's high politics in that, right? Because the Trump administration is promoting more work requirements for food stamps, Medicaid, housing, you name it. So I recognize that was somewhat of a perilous uh, minefield probably for the committee to be trying to traverse. But what I want to focus more on is the sort of practical perspective side of the conversation here. Um, first point I would make on that is this isn't a particularly new or novel um, task, right? So uh, I remember in early 2007 when the new Democrat majority took uh, control in the House, the very first hearing or one of the very first hearings that um, was held was on the economic and social po costs of poverty. Um, and in that hearing, a report authored by folks at the Center for American Progress found that about 4% of GDP, or then about $500 billion, was the cost of child poverty every year. And so that's like the cost of criminality and you know, uh, kids not advancing in school and future earnings losses and things like that. Um, so actually, some of the recommendations made in that 2007 report were actually kind of followed through on. The EITC was expanded uh, subsequent to that. Child tax credit was doubled. Obamacare was created. Medicare was, Medicaid was expanded. Food stamp benefits grew substantially. But I would note that the NAS report finds that the um, cost of child poverty is, if anything, slightly bigger now than it was after some of those similar types of recommendations were implemented in the wake of that 2007 report. Um, and actually, if you look at, C CBO recently put out a report on means-tested benefit, means-tested entitlement benefit spending in the past decade and looking forward in the, to the next decade. What they found was means-tested entitlement spending in the decade from 2009 to 2019 actually was bigger than non-means-tested entitlement spending for things like Social Security and Medica Medicare. So if anything, this pack, past decade was a positive one for the types of programs that you would think would have an effect on reducing child poverty. Going forward, that effect is, is likely to be flipped because you know, as we know the baby boom uh, generation is going to retire, Medicare is going to continue to grow, and so we'll be spending relatively more, the increases will be relatively bigger, uh, that is, um, on the non-means-tested spending going forward than on means-tested benefit spending. So we have kind of an uphill climb if you want to do more and see more of the effects that we want to see from this, this uh, report. Um, Second point I want to uh, note is in setting this in context of what's come since the report came out, it makes some of these recommendations seem almost small, right? So almost every day, which is really kind of breathtaking because you know, you're talking proposals that would increase spending by $100 billion or $80 billion or $30 or $50 billion a year. Um, but in the face of Medicare for all and universal child care and universal everything else, where some of these proposals are literally you know, calling for tens of trillions of dollars in spending, this seems, uh, you guys are almost like pikers by comparison, Ron and Robert. So, um, and um, glad to be pikers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there's that. Um, the other thing, uh, as Robert also uh, made reference to, the minimum wage discussion has sort of moved beyond, I think, where the report was where tomorrow the House is going to debate a bill that will increase the minimum wage to $15. There's, there's actually an interesting sort of sidebar discussion going on about your point exactly about that $10 minimum wage and whether there should be some subtlety about going beyond $10 yeah, yeah. in lots of the country. So yeah, yeah. Um, people can read in the news about that and watch the debate tomorrow. Um, a third point I would say is this report is really federal-centric. Like if you look at the list of benefits that are arrayed here, EITC, federal tax credits, SNAP, SSI, housing, other welfare benefits for non-citizens. It's, it's a real sort of federal mix. And the state side, and not to mention you know, families and charities and the, like the whole rest of the country other than the federal government, almost seems like it's not in the mix. And maybe that's just my interpretation, but just I'm looking at the, <coughs> the list of programs, it's one thing that sort of jumped out at me. Um, and then the final thing, um, and Ron, I think, is skeptical that this could ever get implemented because Ron's kind of a skeptic anyway. But um, the one thing I would, I, I, I would note that 
we have huge deficit issues now, right? We're running trillion dollar deficits at the time when we have 3.5% unemployment rates. Um, House Democrats came in talking about how they're gonna be more fiscally responsible than Republicans were. Um, I'd say both sides have uh, not great records when it comes to uh, guarding the, the federal fisc. Um, but what we're already seeing is some sort of gimmicks enter into play. Today, the House considered a bill under a special new procedure to repeal the Cadillac tax, $200 billion over 10 years. Um, and the way it was brought up meant it didn't have to be paid for, despite sort of general pledges that new spending was going to be paid for. I think there's a window, actually, for Congress to enact something like this. Um, and it <coughs> would, in effect, build on what Congress did the last time we got into uh, financial trouble um, in, the in the Great Recession, and that is the stimulus law. So I've, I've written a little bit about this. I'd point you to a report that I did on this. But what many of the former Obama administration folks that were behind the creation of the temporary stimulus law from, 2007, or from 2009 have been suggesting is that we create permanent stimulus programs. And so things like shovel-ready jobs, more food stamps, um, stimulus checks to individuals, state aid for states through uh, bigger FMAP rates and, and things like that. Instead of being done for, let's say, two years, if Congress thinks that it's necessary to stimulate the economy, those things should really be done permanently. And those programs dial up when the unemployment rate goes up and there's more demand for those kind of stimulus. I could easily see the same sorts of arguments being made. I, I wouldn't be for this because I think that's you know kind of a kind of a gimmick and not the kind of thing you should shoehorn into legislation designed to sort of get us over the sort of immediate economic troubles that we have. But I could easily see somebody making the same sort of argument. If we're going to turn on these permanent stimulus programs in other ways, it wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing to turn on the types of programs that are spotlighted in the NES report. So I, I can see a path to this actually getting done. And so with that, that's my. So, Final practical uh, Matt, perspective. Just to give some context, I don't know if everyone here agrees this is exactly precise, but this is from um, the Urban Institute's Kids Share, um, which is was a little mind blowing for me the first time I saw this graph. So that line there is now, and when you look at how we are currently spending um, our federal dollars. Uh, what you see is we're spending an awful lot of money on adults. Um, people who focused a lot on this in the 1980s probably have this idea that the largest part of our budget is on defense. That's clearly no longer the case. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that uh, Matt and I, I have, Matt has been explaining to me is that from, the pers from his perspective in, in uh, um, the uh, ways and means, um, any uh, 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 people, reports, committees can propose uh, uh, things that make a great deal of sense and let's say they cost 100 billion or maybe only 10 billion, um, but they're not the only thing that's being proposed. And um, you can also see that blue line is interest on the debt. So I am not an economist. There are obviously arguments about how bad the debt is. But what you do see is that we are already spending almost as much money on, the, on debt interest as we are on children um, in this analysis. And the, the, the interest on the debt is going to be outpacing spending on, on children. Um, so that was, that was uh, I think, context for, for the world that, the, that Congress is operating in. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, Ron, do you have thoughts yeah, to share? Go very quickly to catch us up. Yes, thank you. And in just a couple of minutes, I'll make only two points. Uh, one of them is Bob may throw something at me, but uh, there were 15 members of the of the committee. Uh, there were we didn't wear big signs that said Democrat, Republican, or Liberal, Conservative, but there were only two members of the committee that could be easily recognized as right of center. So the committee was really composed of people uh, who didn't have a Tremendous amount of trouble spending $100 billion on these programs. <laughs> on paper, anyway. Well, no, I think they were. They, yes. I think yeah. they were willing to do it. But yeah. anyway, um, nonetheless, the committee got along well. We learned a lot. Everything worked very well. You could tell from, uh, uh, from Robert's presentation that he's an extremely reasonable person. And the committee was reasonable, but there was not a big energy to do things that were economical and uh, could force 
parents and states and private sector and so forth to be part of this, as Matt talked about. Now, the second thing is I want to call your attention to something that you've seen on the, uh, on the big chart. Robert uh, mentioned it, but passed over pretty quickly. Uh, and if you were in the market to be, to find a per the right package of poverty reduction, but minimum spending, the first package on this chart is definitely the winner. There's no question about it. Uh, it has four policies. All of them have to do with taxes. They would increase work by one million workers, which is a tremendous accomplishment in my, my view. Uh, it would reduce uh, the number of kids in poverty by almost 20%, and it would reduce the number of kids in deep poverty by almost 20%, uh, and it would cost less than $9 billion. So especially under the way we've talked about on this panel, including Matt, you shameful thing, the way you talked about spending hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, it would be a really good bargain to spend $8.7 uh, billion and to get that kind of action on child poverty. <clears throat> and certainly Congress could do something along those lines. Uh, and the especially good part is would increase work. Uh, so that would, and I have a feeling that would attract a lot of Republican support uh, for a package like this, because I agree with Matt. Uh, as I always have, that um, work has got to be a big part of this. Without work, without more and more people working, more and more hours at a higher wage, uh, hard to influence the wages, but it's going to be much more difficult to have a major impact on child poverty. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so to shift gears massively, uh, Jim, what does this all sound to you like from your perspective why well, I, I, I want 13,000 people yeah. at the state level who are executing all this stuff. <laughs> I want to agree with Ron. Um, let me let me first start by kind of grounding this in discussion of what it's like to be a poor kid. Okay, because I grew up a poor kid, um, and I can remember uh, my my dad had obsessive compulsive disorder. Worked in the restaurant business. And so he was pretty temperamental, and so he was out of work a lot. And um, I can remember one of the times when he was out of work, and we were out of milk, seven kids, and we're out of milk. And so my mom, you know, scraped together her change purse and the, swept the couch cushions and came up with 95 cents, which is about what a gallon of milk cost back then. And one of us went to the store and got the gallon of milk, um, and then she was making dinner, and she went to move the gallon of milk, which was blocking her, and it crashed to the floor. And this was back when you kids don't remember this, but they actually used to make milk jugs out of glass. Um, and it shattered on the floor. And my mom stood there and cried um, un until she started laughing about the fact that she was actually literally crying over spilt milk. Um, <laughs> But, the, uh, but we, didn't have, we didn't have milk with our cereal the next morning. And, and those kind of experiences do have, you know, they make a lasting impression on you. And so it's no surprise to me that I ended up doing the kind of work that I do. Um, and let me also just kind of clarify my, my biases. One is I'm an unabashed proponent of work, um, in part because I have very personal experience about the difference it makes when a responsible adult in the family is working and when they're not. Um, but I also know, and I'm glad we didn't belabor it, because I think it's almost a self-evident truth. Um, it, work means more than just income, right? Work is a purpose. Work is self-efficacy. Um, work is role modeling. Um, work is self-esteem. Um, and so, uh, I, I don't apologize for being very pro-work. Um, and this actually is from, from my, my former department now. I want to just draw your attention to the, the italic, what's in, in the quotes below. That's one of our, one, one of our uh, beliefs that went along with our core values, which is we believe self-sufficiency meets human needs in ways dependency cannot, um, and just felt strongly about putting a stake in the ground saying, essentially, not all income is equal. Um, but having said that, um, I also believe that 
the economy that we're dealing with today is fundamentally very different than the economy we were able to take advantage of in the late 90s. Um, and that's where I kind of cut my teeth in this business. And we had tremendous success uh, rolling out welfare to work in Illinois. Um, and it was a, a period, it still remains the period in time uh, when child poverty was reduced the most in that state. It is hopelessly entangled with the rollout of the EITC. But we also, we tracked earnings gains among our TANF leavers. Um, and don't quote me on this because it was a long time ago. But I, you know, I want to say that on average, over two years, if, if somebody remained employed two years, they could expect earnings gain on the order of 12%, is the way I remember it now. Um, and I just don't think that's true in this economy. And I think policy has to take stock of that fact. Um, the other thing that, and I don't want to sound like I am, like I've grown jaded after my, my years running that department, um, but I'm, I started as, with a very healthy skepticism about the ability of any large enterprise, government or private sector, to effectively execute the policies that it chooses. And you know, that's the difference between success and failure. It's not the, the best policy in the world isn't worth a quarter if you can't execute it, um, which is why I was crestfallen when I saw some of the silly stuff in my estimation that came out in the House Farm Bill related to SNAP. Um, because I also have to say, let me give a shout out to my folks back in Illinois. You know, we, we raised execution to as high a level science as we could. Um, and we were pretty damn good at it, much better than most, I would say. And we started by, as you know, this indicates, being very clear about our values and beliefs. Um, to help our workforce connect what we were asking them to do with why it was important. Um, and then we used uh, Stephen Covey's four disciplines of execution uh, to set wildly important goals and track our progress toward those goals. And then we mined the resulting data to identify production bottlenecks. And we used lean production techniques to uh, address those bottlenecks and remove them. And we used something called lean experimentation to uh, develop and test new interventions in a way that included our stakeholders and our staff. Um, and so it was, you know, we, we really, we, we were executing at a very high level compared to most state governments. But when I saw the stuff in that farm bill, I was like, Jim, could you speak more specifically it. about well, what you're... Well, just things like, and, and I don't want to belabor that because I know that's not really what we're here to talk about. But um, they would have us they would have had us um, report to the federal government every month on the work status of every SNAP client. And what's wrong with that? It's undoable, OK, because SNAP clients, you got to remember, you, you, a SNAP application has two elements to it, OK? And you have to provide a name. You have to provide an address. It doesn't have to be your address. It doesn't have to be a permanent address. It just has to be an address. And once a state receives that, the clock starts ticking on them processing your application for benefits. That constitutes a SNAP application. Um, this, most states, and Illinois included, have no good way to follow up with every client every month to ascertain, are you still at the job? Um, and, and more to the point, I would postulate that ACF had, or USDA had no conceivable use for that kind of micro data. Um, you know, we needed data not at that level of granularity to run our programs, but it was virtually worthless to the feds as far as I can see. I think there was a, you know, people have become enamored in the era of big data uh, that more is better, but that was ridiculous and it would have swamped, you know, our overtaxed workforce. I also have to say, now that I've given them a shout out, it's important to understand that um, of our 13,000 employees about Somewhere between 95 and 95, 98% of them were in public employee unions, um, including well, the psychiatrists had a union, okay? They make $300,000 a year, um, and they had a union. And it was, so trying to implement things like work standards that the union would go along with was kind of a fool's errand, you know? The, the, 
the unions wanted to set the work standards, or they knew you know, 90% of their members could get across the mark. And that's a recipe for mediocrity. So it was very frustrating. And, and it, so, so my, my, I, I think it was a really important and beneficial report. I really loved the stuff related to the EITC, the stuff related uh, to the, the child care tax credit, um, because those are work incentives that require no human intervention. But you know, one thing I learned in my four years running DHS is um, overestimating the ability of large bureaucracies to, to, to execute um, is a big mistake. Um, and they have their hands full just trying to process things like SNAP benefits for food. And to my mind, um, and I think Washington State has done a really good job of this. They were kind of our model, unfortunately. Our, uh, our governor didn't get reelected, so we'll never, we'll never know if we were able to replicate that. But that's where we were trying to go is toward a, a pull model of employment where people wanted our help because we were so damn good at helping people get jobs um, rather than a push model where we're saying, well, we're going to remove your food security if you don't cooperate with us. Um, and as, as a kid who grew up knowing some food insecurity, you know, I, I just don't think that is a decent or humane thing to do. Um, I, I applaud work, but I think we need to do it the right way. And so selecting benefits, there's, there's obviously a great benefit to the, to the bottom line, um, as Ron points out, if we do things that rely on work. The one place I'd part company with them is, I, I love the concept of work advance, and I think it's worth more testing of um, and more emulation, but I don't think we know enough about it to say, and, and the impacts, you know, would suggest, you know, it's not going to be as big as these other things in, in reducing poverty. And because of what, at least I, and I, uh, my, my, my sense of the existing labor market, I, I worry about putting too many eggs in that basket. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe the real, the secret sauce is somewhere in between the stuff that was in package two and package three, maybe. Um, and, and maybe including work advance in that as well. But that, that's kind of, that was kind of my take on it. Thank you very much. So we're going to have to move to questions. We, this is, we don't have enough time for an, a, a, an amazing um, conversation. One thing that just strikes me, though, is um, how unfortunate it is that there would not be this kind of combination of people sort of at the front end of thinking about these things, whether the report or federal policy, right? Because, I mean, just hearing you talk, Jim, it's, just, it's clear that there, I'm sure not all state um, uh, human services administrators are created equal, um, but that there's really a wealth of knowledge and experience that we, we really don't, we have inadequate mechanisms in DC for bringing that to bear on these, on these questions. And then I uh, th this, and then on, on our end, I mean, I sent Jim this slide. Um, <laughs> this is Matt's creation from when he was at Ways and Means. So this is on your tables, uh, benefits and services for low-income individuals. So I sent that to him, and he just emailed me back. <laughs> that brings <laughs> that bring, brings back memories. <laughs> so that those dots are all the dots that end up. Uh, probably the the vast majority were under your jurisdiction. So right. you had your thirteen thousand people, and each one of those, I guess, they're bubbles. Each one of those bubbles is a, a separate federal program that has its own set of regulations and a whole set of humans who are very invested in their regulations. And you can understand that each individual bubble can is very is making perfect sense, but then it an ends up, uh, talk about a bottleneck, then y you are in a position of answering to each and every one of those uh, bubbles. So these are the sorts of disconnects that I, I, I think we, we I, I wish we, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I think this is, to me, the most interesting kind of, of conversation to, to have. Um, so um, we should have planned this event for longer, to, um, but let, let's um, have uh, uh, questions, if there are any questions. Um, before, just quick, uh, when you um, please uh, say who you, your name and where you're from. Uh, Bruce? Uh, there, Bruce? Oh, sorry, I wait for the microphone. Sure. I forgot to say that, yeah. Uh, Bruce Meyer, University of Chicago and AEI. So this report is very impressive. Um, the coverage of it and 
the um, attention to the evidence base. Um, there are some weaknesses of it. Robert was smart not to talk about the poverty measurement part because that's a real weak part of the report. But um, I have a few comments that maybe you can r respond to. My, my reaction to a lot of the proposals is that it's um, more of the same. So, you know, if you look at the um, package three, um, it's expanding the EITC, expanding, um, well, adding a child allowance that's like a child tax credit or the additional tax credit, expanding SNAP, expanding housing benefits. So I worry that um, there's diminishing returns, that's basic principle in economics. We've done a lot of that already. Um, and we might expect that the returns in terms of uh, improvements in child outcomes would be less and the uh, 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 work disincentives as you have more generous programs with higher um, implicit taxes, uh, things um, are, are uh, less good for work. And um, Robert, you mentioned how uh, you're not keen on some of the evidence from the 90s. Well, a lot of the evidence on the effects of these programs is from the 90s or even earlier when they were small and, and just, just getting started and, and people at the bottom were even more deprived. Um, so um, I'm not sure that we can expect quite the bang for the buck that um, you know we, we got from the earlier uh, uh, introduction and initial expansion of these programs. And I, I also worry a little bit that um, you're emphasizing here just giving people more money, and we're pretty good at that, but um, I'm not sure that that emphasizes work and responsibility enough in a way that's going to discourage single motherhood, discourage dropping out, discourage crime. Um, I, you know, I, it, it doesn't really send a message of you are in this too, you have to uh, change your, your your life, um, and uh, uh, I, I worry that um, it, it might not have uh, the, the uh, intended effects. Except that <clears throat> many of the benefits, you don't get anything additional unless you work more or work at all. Uh, so there's a national, and that is why when you do the, uh, when you analyze what the impacts are uh, based on previous work, that that's how you get the impacts on poverty, and that's how you get the increases in work. All these packages gave benefits to people for working more. So you don't think that that would have an impact? I don't think it has the impact that, say, um, my reading of the evidence is that the big reduction in poverty is in about more work really to the exclusion of other things, that this is uh, y your chance to take responsibility for, for your life. But Bruce, like, would you, would you <laughs> allow that that was a different economy back in the 90s? Um, unemployment is a lot lower than it was then. I mean, and so, you know, I, I think that... Um, but I think, um, what about earnings gain? I mean, I think that's, that's what motivates people to stay at work and to work harder, and that, that that's what makes it worth it to leave the house in the morning is the prospect that things are going to get better. And I just know that, you know. Well, I'm one that's argued that the earnings gains have been dramatically understated in official statistics, that people are just a lot better off at the bottom than they were 20 years ago. You know, my favorite thing is to point to housing characteristics. and almost whatever housing characteristic you point to for the bottom 20% now looks like what the middle had, tw um, the middle 20% had 20 years ago. You know, some, so, you know, 
So you guys, I am going to um, uh, um, highlight that for our audience here and online, um, we're not going to be answering this question. And I think what this, this, this uh, dialogue is highlighting um, are the core questions. So anybody who's interested in research, anybody who's interested in policy, these are the questions that we need to be uh, thinking through, um, in, in some cases, gathering uh, better data on. Um, and but I, I want to make sure we have time for at least one more question. So hopefully, we'll be able to continue this conversation afterwards. But as I said, I, I think this really provides a window into the kinds of questions that are at the heart of figuring out what, what to do. Um, there's no, I think there's no disagreement among, uh, on, on, the, on wanting to make things better for people, um, but very smart, thoughtful people have a range of different perspectives on, on that. Um, and in my view, we need to enlarge the pool of information and, and perspectives that we have uh, rather than shrink it, um, which, is, which is, again, why I'm excited to have this group of, of people here. Um, so I, we're already over. Um, if anybody has to leave, we won't consider you rude. But I want to give time for at least one or two other, other questions. Are there any questions? Uh, uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you all so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Tobin. I'm at CSIS. Um, you've talked a lot about the uh, poverty reduction outcome impacts and the overall cost of these programs. But I'm wondering if you could each discuss from the political feasibility standpoint, where a sort of bipartisan coalescence starts to form around some of these packages. Um, when you add that as kind of one of the key features, do you see uh, that more uh, affordable option become more popular or feasible? Or sort of some of these more expensive uh, options that might represent some more bipartisan uh, solutions seem more likely or feasible to you? Thank you. That is a terrific question. Uh, Matt, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> sure. Um, well. So it's always easier to pass things that are cheaper, right? Uh, especially if you're looking to pay for things. So you know you default to sort of package one as opposed to packages three and four. Um, but that said, there's something in this that Republicans may like, right? So Republicans have historically been for things like expanding EITC. Uh, child credit was actually significantly increased in the 2017 tax bill. Um, so, but Matt, Matt, could you just say something very quickly about why Republicans like those things? Uh, I think because they like families, they like children, okay. they're like everybody else, right? <laughs> they're, um, that's why. That's yeah. the reason. And they like work. Yeah, and they like, yeah. They like work. Okay. Right. Yeah. right. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, there are options here. In fact, I mean, I, I didn't mention this before, but sort of aspects of what is in the report has already passed the Ways and Means Committee this year, right? So there's been an expansion of the EITC for childless workers, not, you know, not exactly the same, but sort of the same ballpark. Uh, increase in the refundability of the child credit, expansion in child care funding without pay-fors. It was not bipartisan, but it, you know, those things are in a range where if you could figure out some way to cobble something together, it's theoretically possible you could imagine a package like that being moved on a bipartisan basis. Or what we have tended to do in this town lately, which is I think a bad development, we just jam things through that we want on a partisan basis, right? We do Obamacare, we do Republican tax cuts, we do stimulus, and it's either all or almost all one party supporting something. As I suggested, that may be the future of something like this, maybe the future of a whole bunch of other things like this, um, but that's always a possibility as well. Ron, do you have anything to I add? Mean, the only thing I was going to say is I think there are a lot of, in the old days when Congress actually worked, there would be a lot of opportunity for a compromise because um, there are additional benefits and poverty goes down. Democrats like that a lot. That's near the top of their priority, and Republicans like to do it too, except they like to do it with uh, in, in ways that would increase work. That's yeah. why I think I was really astounded by these packages. You want to increase employment by a million people. Uh, I think you'd have to overcome the idea that the only way to really increase employment is to have mandatory work requirements, because these don't have that. But it's still increased employment, I and mean, people will work for more money. So I think there's some real possibilities here, but the way that Congress works is just nuts. And plus, they might wind up spending, I wouldn't dare to do any of this stuff because they might wind up spending another 20, 50, 100 million dollars, you know. Uh, Matt pointed out they're talking about trillions now. It's just, it's outrageous. And our kids are going to wind up paying for it. 
Robert, do you have any very la quick last words? Uh, well, I just want to read a couple of things, repeat what Ron said was we, we view our report as pretty pro-work <laughs> and, uh, and we found every one of our programs that you know, we proposed, uh, uh, the, at least the combinations, all increased work and we believed a lot of that. I want to say too that it is more, it's more than money. I want to tell everybody if you haven't read Catherine Eden's book on, called It's Not Like I'm Poor, where she went out and talked to people who got the EITC and how happy they were to be not on welfare and getting money from working. It was a source of great pride to them. They felt like they were included. The self-esteem you mentioned, it was all there. That's what you want, okay? That's what you want. And I think almost everybody would like that to solve the problem. Unfortunately, that doesn't solve everybody's problem, but, but that's, it's certainly there. So, and, and one real quick thing, we didn't do much on the state level, uh, but we have talked to people in the states and we say, listen, read our report, Think what you can do. There's so many things you can do at the state level. There's childcare, you know, there's housing, you know, your state EITC, all kinds of things states can do. Mm -hmm. We hope that they read the report and they get ideas. So uh, it wasn't a, a, a neglect by intention, right. you know, but hopefully some of them will take it up. Well, um, please join me in thanking this fabulous panel. Thank you all. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>